This is Henry Sanders back with another episode of Real Talk. We want to thank our sponsors at Park Bank. Thank you for everything that you're doing for us. Thank you for Facebook Journalism Project. Thank you for supporting us through this time. Uh, it's been a while since we've we've had one of these. We've kind of took a break, uh, and but we're back. And you know, every time I say this, it's like it's been a long time since I've talked to the Lieutenant Governor, and so much has happened. Uh, but so much has happened, and that's the only way I can say. Uh, what's going on in Wisconsin right now? So, and nationwide. So, how are you doing, uh, Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes? Doing, you know, doing all right, man. We're, I guess we're back for season two. Um, <laughs> right. But you know, I'm I'm doing all right, man. Like I said, all things considered. But it's like every other conversation we had, there are more things to be considered. So, so much. I mean, there's so much that happens. Okay. We could talk about COVID-19 and get all that stuff. And we know that the numbers and we know that schools and we know all that stuff's happening and schools in the state are going virtual. We know all that stuff. Let's put that. COVID's a big deal. I'm not I'm not diminishing that. I have kids, virtual, like all that stuff's going on. Let's put that aside. Let's start with the DNC convention, right? So you you had a, a major part actually you actually had a major part you cut the beard off look at you looking the beard going back a little bit uh, what what what's that why don't you leave the beard why don't you rick ross it up there and like have the beard and well because my mom doesn't like when i hide my face so <laughs> I figured i'd cut it off before That's i had nice. to hear her mouth All right mama you know mama will tell you too. tell you quick tell you quick so one how did you feel about the overall convention how did you feel about it I mean, look, for what they had to do and the amount of time, I think it was amazing. Like, really, like the production of it. You know, I, you know, a lot of people, I do share the concern a lot of people had where, you know, there weren't as many, you know, leading younger progressive voices that people may have wanted to see. Uh, I totally understand that. But uh, I do also, you know, realize like pulling this kind of thing off, man, it's not easy. Uh, folks had to work with what they had to do this very quick turnaround. You know, we were, it was like almost at the last minute that they, that they were able to pull it together. So overall pulling it off, my hat goes off to all the organizers, everybody who worked for the DNC, everybody who tried to make it happen. Um, still proud that Milwaukee was able to be the anchor and nobody can ever take away the fact that, you know, we were the host site. We beat out other large, we beat out much larger cities, uh, then our cities will have far more capacity to host such an event. So something our city and state should be extremely proud of. Yeah. And hopefully they'll bring it back. Right. Hopefully. They'll try hey, to bring I'm, it back to look, them. man, I, I said it. I said it. We deserve to get a to get a mulligan. Right. Right. For real. So, I mean, I watched the whole convention. I watched both conventions. I watched the RNC convention and the DNC. Convention. I, you know, I, I I love watching the politics this time of year. Right. I just love watching my political background. So. What what was your biggest takeaway from the convention, DNC convention? Because for me, like the biggest takeaway with Michelle Obama is a boss. Like Michelle Obama, to me, uh, she was on. I think she like her, dislike her. She was powerful. She was impactful. Uh, Michelle Obama was, was incredible, man. You know, she was. I mean, she always is. She always delivers, and. You know, when I was I was listening to her, she's like, there's no perfect president. It's like you gonna sit up there and say there's no perfect president when you sitting up here talking, <laughs> you know, <laughs> no perfect candidate, I should say. Yeah. And, um, you know, I know that she's politics averse. So that's a dream deferred. But um, Michelle Obama was just so incredible. Barack Obama gave the yeah. most passionate, um, you know, emotional appeal that I've ever heard in any political convention. And it just spoke to, you know, the urgency of the moment, right? Like it was, you know, he, he he's known for getting people, you know, ready to go, fired up and ready to go. But this was a direct personal appeal that Barack Obama made. And, you know, people, people see it. People felt that the, the struggle and, and, the, and the sincerity and um, just overall, I think what the DNC did well was capture uh, America's diversity. So had that that roll call across the states, that was incredibly uh, well done. Uh, I'm so honored that I was able to participate in that. That was historic. We went all across the states and territories and saw people like the but my biggest takeaway from that one was obviously <laughs> was Maine, where, you know, the black guy showed up from Maine. Then he talked about being a, it's like, whoa, all right, cool. <laughs> then he said he's an organic farmer. It's like, 
all right and then he talked about his husband it's like what <laughs> it's just it was like it just it, what's next <laughs> it was like, he, he brought it all man yeah, so like it was just um it, it was just it was incredible to see man uh that roll call across the states and it showed how uh, the party is a party that seeks to unite this country man and you saw a whole lot of division the following week with the rnc i guess we'll get into that one in a second yeah. So it's interesting you saying that. Right. So my takeaway from the, the convention, Democratic convention was empathy was a big part of it. I think uh, Biden was trying to show that he's a statesman, that you're, you're safe in his hands uh, and you can't trust the president Trump. Like you just can't trust him. And I think people gave real reasons why you can't trust him and his agenda moving forward. That was my big takeaway from it. Oh, and. I think you you mentioned something about progressives. Clearly, the Biden uh, team decided that they didn't want that progressive that progressive agenda to be as forefront um, as part of the platform. I won't say clearly. I, I I can't speak to that. I can't confirm that or not. You know, and it's it's it's, it's whatever. You know, like we you can't. I, I, I was proud to be a part of it, man, but. I, I don't. I won't necessarily. I, Cause I can't. I can't just sit here and say that that was. No, I'm. I'm saying. I'm saying. I'm saying. Oh, I'll let you say. Say whatever yeah, you want to say. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying. I'm saying. I'm, I'm saying. I'm tired that, of arguing with you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm saying. I'm saying that it just seemed like that wasn't you know good or bad. I, you know whatever. It seemed like he was going for middle of the, middle of America, the people, the swing voters, the people haven't decided. He was trying to make a case to them. Why I think when you get to the uh, the Republican convention, I don't think Trump made a real push for the middle of America swing borders at all. Uh, I think he was really going for his base, which was different tactics. Right. But um, how did you feel about when you spoke? How did you feel? Um, You know, I, I felt like I, I wanted to like squeeze as much as I could into what little time I had. Um, had a little fumble at the end, but picked it up and got to the end zone regardless. Um, <laughs> But it was uh, like, like I said, it was an honor to be able to uh, deliver the roll call on behalf of the state, man. And at the same time, be able to talk about some of the things that some of our challenges, but also uh, provide an optimistic view of things. You know, I try to always provide an optimistic view of thing, uh, of everything, even right now at this moment we're in uh, with Kenosha. Right. Like I try to uh, make sure that I, I, I talk about as devastating as things have gotten. I think what we're seeing in the wake of it will ultimately put us in a much better place than we were before it. Yeah, let's hope so. Um, let's hope so. Let's talk about the Repo- Republican convention before we get to <laughs> Kenosha. Uh, my, my whole energy, when you talk about Kenosha, my whole energy just dropped. I know, that's man. A, that's I know. A, that's a whole different conversation. Okay. Yep. So let's talk about the Republican convention. What was your takeaway from that that spectacle? I mean, it was. what did you think? I think it was out of touch, man. It was out of touch with the with the broad spectrum of the American public, man. Like you said, it spoke to it spoke to a certain uh, segment of the population, a very specific segment. It didn't speak to everybody. It didn't it didn't even seem to have a desire to want to bring people together. It, it firmly placed people uh, in in different camps, and that was dangerous, man. That's that's like. You know, it's, it's, it is literally fascism that we're seeing. Even the soundtrack, man. Did you listen to, like, the soundtrack? <laughs> it was, like, it was so, it, it was it was kind of scary, man. It's like like a, like a some kind of Trump action film. And, and, and his speech, dude, his acceptance speech was just all over the place. It was you know, long. It, it, was, it, was long. it was very long. It was incoherent. And it just, like, it just rambled on and on and on and on. And I guess we're supposed to expect... You know this this macho man to, to save us a self self described one or a self assumed one, but it just wasn't it wasn't what we need right now. It wasn't it did not meet the moment. Like it it, it only uh, it, I mean it met the moment if you want to further uh, continue down the path of division, sure. But for what we need as you know Americans, it, it just did not answer the call. What did you take away from so many black speakers speaking at the convention? And, you know, I'm talking about black folk, like black, black folk. It wasn't like, like, you know, like black folks with black, you know, you know what I'm talking about. Come on now. Like black folk with black experiences, right? Like people were talking about, I thought Tim Scott was brilliant. I mean, I, I thought if, if, if Tim Scott was on a ticket for the Republicans, 
I mean, it won't happen, right? But if it happened, he would be he would be fascinating to watch how that played out nationally. But what was your take? I mean, just seeing all those black faces and those black voices speaking at a Republican convention. It's the most I've ever seen. Um, right. And, and the, the, the wild part is that, you know, Republican Party wouldn't have anything to do with them if it wasn't an election year, if the election wasn't as consequential. You know, once this is over, these people aren't going to be accepted at a Republican Party meeting. Like, they're not going to be able to just show up and, and talk about the things that are impacting their lives. Right. Like, and it, it would be foolish to, to believe that these are people who, you know, have been used, unfortunately. Right. Like, you can... And it and also took people who had some really difficult life situations and, right. you know, some some real challenges. And those challenges were, you know, politicized. And, you know, somebody thinks that Donald Trump is the person who's responsible for the one thing in their life that, you know, happened to improve. You know, you can it's, it's easy to manipulate a person like that. And I'm not even going to sit here and say they were manipulated. I don't know what their frame of mind is. But what I am saying is that the Republican Party is not going to have anything to do with them. Uh, they didn't have anything to do with them prior to uh, to the convention. And then afterwards, I, you, I, if I were a betting man, I would say that they're not going to have anything to do with them afterwards. What was your take when um, clearly the Republicans were talking about their protest as looters and, you know, whatever other word they were saying, uh, what, what what's your take on that? Because if you listen to the Democratic convention, it was the, it was protests, peaceful protests. The Republicans were you know these agitators, looters, two different worlds. Yeah, uh, and not not only did they have protesters uh, at the at the convention, not only did they have the family uh, of George Floyd, there were also some very measured conversations with police officers at uh at, for for the DNC. And that is what I mean by a, a, reaching a broad spectrum of America. The, the RNC was nothing like it. And the reason they paint uh, this stuff is, you know, these violent protesters tearing up American cities is because they don't want to take responsibility uh, for choices that they've made, for their lack of desire to implement any sort of accountability, uh, for their lack of desire to move towards equity. And it's so bizarre, too, because, you know, the... The prevailing theme was, uh, you know, this would be Joe Biden's America, as if we aren't in America with Donald Trump as president at this very moment. Mm-hmm. That's a good point, right? I think that's a really good point. The 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 president was talking like what was happening was on under someone else's watch and yeah. not his watch. I think I think that to me, I mean, there's lots of things you can always in politics on both sides you can take shots at. I think that was to me was one of his biggest. Um, vulnerabilities was, yeah, you're saying this stuff, but this all happened under your watch. And so what you like, I think, you know, I don't care what side you're on. You, that's a logical question though. Yep. I hear you. And I want to feel safe. And I think all these people are whatever he's saying, but this is all happening while you're, you're being president of the United States, Mr. President, how would you answer that? And I think that's a fair critique of, of, of him. Yeah. Um, and it, and it's, this guy still has his acolyte. So they aren't going anywhere. <laughs> yeah. And, Again, I think it'll be a close election as always. And I think uh, clearly uh, Trump was playing for the black vote. And that, you know, it's interesting that the Republicans were doing it. And I, for, for the black community, there's lots of ways to look at it, right? What's going on, what they did. But what the, I'm always trying to be positive. So I'm going to say the positive yeah. side of it, all right? The positive side is people see the power of the black vote and they're trying to figure out ways to get it. And they know they need it. If, if, if just... 12 percent, 50 percent of black folks vote for uh, Republicans. They win. Right. So it's like the power of the black vote was to me was on on like everyone saw how important we were and how important we are to the election. And so black folks take that to heart and use that to move forward to move a platform that helps us. So. Yeah, that's the thing. Like they, you know, recognizing the amount of our folks that didn't decided that 2016 wasn't worth it. They feel that if they can redirect even more of the vote, then they'll get re- then they will get reelected. Yeah. So okay, enough of the convention stuff, not politics stuff. Uh, interesting. I, I, for me, you uh, you did a proud brother for representing us how you did. It was proud to see a black man up there holding us down. So I appreciate that. Much love for you holding us down like that, man. So I appreciate that from Wisconsin guy to you. I appreciate that what you did for us. Thank you. Um, so now let's talk about. Uh, let's go to Kenosha, man. Like. Um, <sighs> Uh, 
So let's talk about Mr. Blake getting shot uh, seven times and um, the impact of Kenosha, the impact it did nation, nationwide. And when where were you when you first heard about it and saw the, and saw the video, et cetera? Yeah, I was actually, uh, I was uh, sitting outside and I think I was reading and I saw it. That was like, it was so just eerie too, man. I was having like a great day. <laughs> That's the thing about it too, that just like a great day. It was relaxed. I got to like finish this book outside, enjoying the weather, man. And then uh, I saw something on my phone. And, you know, obviously my first reaction was the what I tweeted. It was like, you have got to be kidding me. You know, just to think that, you know, over the last several months, all the, all the protests, all the demands and calls for justice for this to still take place, for a person to still get shot in the back seven times, you know, it was... Absolutely disturbing, as I've you know said many times before, and it just put that reminder in you know in me that's just like well, as far as we've come, as far as we thought we've gone, like we still are in a rut. How do you how do you be a, a black man and then a black leader and a black lieutenant governor also put that into leading a state? That's so divided right now. You know, I hate to say around race line. I think it's deeper than that, but it's divided right now. How do you balance that versus your being a black leader and it's your tough, black man. experience? Yeah, not not gonna lie, it's tough because you know these are issues that I personally carry, <laughs> and you know it's not a uh, it, there's not anybody else that has to uh, you know statewide that carry that shoulders that same personal burden, right? This is still the reality uh for me when i go to sleep at night and wake up so it's like you don't you don't get to take off you know, i don't get to just go do an interview about it and just be done with it i don't get to just say you know make a statement and then go on to the next thing right uh because we all know people who dealt with a, a someone even if they didn't get shot by a police officer have had some sort of adverse interaction with law enforcement or criminal justice system in general i like to remind people that you know interactions with law enforcement is a small piece of the criminal justice puzzle because you don't go to prison without first having some interaction with a member of law enforcement you, you go to court and before that you get arrested so we need to look at that uh in in, in big picture terms so we all know people who've had uh, interactions with the criminal justice system in one way or another and so you can't help but think about that you can't help but think about the very real fears and concerns that uh, a lot of people we know have. And so it does, it, it, it's tough. And then at the same time, like I don't get to stop, I don't get to pause <laughs> being Lieutenant Governor to go, you know, to go talk about this and address this like today. And, and it really got put into context for me today because we had a meeting about rural prosperity. Like those are things we still have to talk about. Like, I, you know, these issues, the other issues that Wisconsin is facing are not going away. Like, we still are in a crisis with, with COVID-19. We're still in a crisis with unemployment, with our economy. And I, I'm, I still have to address those issues. I still have to work uh, to, to try to figure out a solution here in Wisconsin. So, you know, other and, and the thing is, like, people who don't have to carry that personal burden of, like, you know, issues of black lives they don't you know it, it, it's a little bit easier to go into just going into that other thing going in to talk about rural prosperity uh going in to talk about you know whatever issue falls under the sun and i picked rural prosperity because it's like those are two issues that are really far apart from each other yeah. and, <laughs> you know? so and, and it's like so wisconsin but it's, it's still wisconsin they, and they are issues that i still mm -hmm. you know need to need to be able to uh, to navigate and address with the same intensity right like these are like i have to i have to talk about the loss of family farms and you know rural economies being depleted uh with the same intensity that i that i talk about jacob blake because you know that is that is all a part of our state like these are these are all instances uh of of, of wisconsin activity in one way or another so what do you say to people um, for who are who are scared about the Black Lives Matters movement? Not, I hate saying that because that's it's broader than just a Black Lives Matters movement. Right. I think that it's bigger than that. But that's the only way I can use the word that people understand it. Right. So what do you say to the people who are who are those suburban folks, those rural people, in Wisconsin right now? 
who are like, yeah, I'm against racism, but I'm also against looting. I'm against yeah. violent protesting. I'm, I'm scared because there's so much unrest going on that I feel like I might not be safe. Uh, and my values and my way of life is being attacked. How, what what do you say to those people who feel like the the Democratic Party and the the this Black Lives Matter movement is trying to take all that from them? What do you yeah. say to those people? See, I don't I don't I don't want people to get caught up in that. I want people to recognize, you know, why we are in that place. Why people may get disruptive uh, during protests. Right. This is a this is a generations long issue that centuries long issue. If you want to be frank, uh, that that people that we're dealing with man this is a this is a reckoning because people have failed to address those uh underlying issues have failed to meet the moment after it happens repeatedly and so for people who may be concerned i i get it right like i i do get that there is a very uh that that, that there's that there's a concern that you know people have who haven't had to experience the injustice side of it but only see uh, these images that um, you know that may induce some sort of uh, some sort of hesitation, some sort of fear. I totally understand that, uh, but I want people to think about how scared other folks are in communities before the protest. How how fearful you know a lot of people uh, are because of the distrust that they have. Uh, with, with with government, a distrust for uh, law enforcement, and I, I've been making the point more so, uh, e- explicitly more so now, that you know law enforcement has to do more to 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 work to restore trust, man. Like when things go awry, like it, it can't just be a, a blame shifting thing. It can't just be there. You can't just sit here and act like you operate perfectly, right? Like even even. In elected office, if I said that everything worked out perfectly, we know that would be a lie. So it would be ridiculous for us to assume that every uh, interaction with law enforcement was just this pristine interaction where all sides um, understood uh, the reason why things are happening and it happened reasonably. That would be ridiculous. And so when they come out after these sort of instances and you know suggest that officers acted 100 percent perfectly every time, People know that that's not the truth. And so that further creates the uh, distrust between law enforcement and communities. They always say, well, why didn't the person comply? Why didn't the person follow orders? Well, it's because the person probably didn't trust that the situation was going to end well for them in the first place. And so it becomes almost some sort of, uh, you know, self-preservation. You got to do what you got to do. I got to if I need to get away, I got to get away. But not don't want to be a sitting duck because you see videos also of people 100 percent complying, throwing their hands in the air still getting tackled and I, I think that the longer that you know especially you know representatives in in, in you know law enforcement agent not agencies but associations um, as long as they continue to uh, you know defend the most egregious actors then we're gonna continue to see uh, distrust and I think that is a, a huge part of the problem because it's always uh, one person's word versus the uh, police officer's word and people have been, you know, people accept to accept the, well, I should say the law or whoever is in, when the ultimate, when the bigger decision is finally made, it seems that the word of officers are, are taking carte blanche, but video evidence over the last several years has like made people second guess, people who didn't have experiences uh, with law enforcement. You know, a lot of people, and then you see more uh, more investigations that show how people have had drugs planted on them, things we've known for years. People have, you know, you see investigations about all kinds of like trumped up charges and all kinds of stuff that's just ridiculous, man. And like I said, it's things that they aren't new to us. <laughs> you know, we've all heard those stories, but, you know, now the American public is, is starting to see a little bit more. And, you know, we just need transparency. We need accountability. Uh, I want to get to the bucks in a second here, but what so what about police officers? Right. So there's a lot of police officers who. Who are doing good work and who are doing the job the best they can, and the police officers put their, their lives at risk every day, serving and protecting uh, and those police officers who are starting to feel 
fearful or scared or not appreciated, um, what are some of the things that you could feel like reforms that can deal with those type of things that help them do their jobs well and actually serve to protect like, and deal with all the issues at the same time? So that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, for those officers that are doing the right thing, uh, we need to understand that it isn't necessary. It isn't officers. It's policing. Policing is 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 the bigger issue right now. Uh, we're talking about uh, we're talking about a profession that hasn't adapted to changing circumstances. Uh, that is living very much in the past. Uh, that isn't. Uh, moving uh, parallel towards where the American people are when it comes to criminal justice reform. So when we are you know, working to uh, meet America where it is right now uh, in terms of responding to communities, law enforcement is a part of that equation, but they aren't they haven't been going in the same direction. And it, it feels like, you know, uh, they don't want to in many instances. And I, I say policing, I'm not Targeting any police officer, I'm talking about the fact there are so many other areas that are in need of reform in government. We always talk about reforming things in government. We always talk about doing things differently uh, to modernize, to meet the need. We have to modernize policing. I don't mean getting high tech weapons. I mean modernizing in the sense that you know there is a a way things that should be done because criminal justice uh, over the last few generations on the track that we were headed still are headed in many instances it's not sustainable it's not working and it's ultimately making communities less safe yeah thanks for answering i think that's important for people to hear like you're not saying that all police officers are bad or you're not saying that you know you're saying we want to do it right and i love what you just said about making modernize it like let's make sure that we're doing it for today's world and i think that makes so much sense so let's talk about the bucks man i was so proud of the bucks that they they made a stance and they led the stance uh of, like i thought that was powerful and i i think i read that you, they communicated with you on this right did mm-hmm. they did that happen yeah, I had a chance to speak with uh, some Bucks players when they were in the locker room. Uh, it was after they stepped off the court, or after they decided to not go on the court. And, and, and how, um, how, how was that? How was that conversation then? I mean, it was a solid conversation. Like, I, I had a chance to speak with a lot of them before when we, when we did that trip to Racine Correctional Institution back in December. So a lot of the same people, uh, Sterling Brown, Kyle Corver, um, George Hill, they were – they were like the most inquisitive, you know, asking questions about, you know, what's next? What do we need to be doing? How do we fix this? Um, What has been, um, what has changed since the murder of George Floyd? And, you know, I'm like, well, not a lot. And we introduced a reform package back two months ago and the legislature hasn't responded. So when George Hill, you know, called out the legislature for, you know, not meeting, like that was, uh, an incredible moment for for me personally because it's like you know this is what's happening and not enough people know I have my audience my audience is a is an audience that's pretty tied into politics you know say for you know a few of my personal friends but their audience is much different and so when they can reach a a, a totally different audience you know people who still have questions have concerns uh that aren't following me on twitter because they don't care about (laughs) the nuts and bolts of politics but they do care about basketball and they do care about opinions of their athletes i think that does a a world of difference in getting people you know engaged yeah i thought it was powerful just because all stuff going on wisconsin and we we had the bucks lead this uh i thought it was powerful so before we go um lieutenant governor I brought this up to you months ago. Our brand, the state of Wisconsin brand, how people perceive us looking outside, looking in. What would you say to those people who are looking at us outside, looking in, who, like, especially a person of color, you're looking at Wisconsin as a state and they're like, these people are backwards. They're crazy. Like, what, what would you say to them about the state of Wisconsin? I think it's important that they hear your perspective because you're so in tune with what Wisconsin truly is. Wisconsin is still a mixed bag. You know, we got our challenges, right? But those challenges were there before we, before we got there. What we do have is people who are ready to step out and make communities whole, man, ready to rebuild all this from the ground up. Uh, 
literally in, in some instances that we're seeing. So I think that despite all the challenges, people should feel like Wisconsin is a place that's ready to meet those challenges. And change isn't easy, especially as these things have been going on. The, the, the systems that we seek to ch uh, change have been in place for so long. Uh, it, it will be it's a difficult process. I, I get it. You know, and I just want people uh, to look at Wisconsin as a place that will serve as an example to the rest of the country about how to do it better, and how to do it right. Yeah. And I, thank you for that. Because I think, I mean, I have all my friends are texting me from people, all the places like what's going on in Wisconsin. I mean, I think, you know, we do have our challenges, but I agree with you. A lot of this we see going on in Wisconsin is a confrontation of disruption for people wanting to change and people of color having a stronger voice and a voice that being amplified and with the, who are empowered uh, where that doesn't happen in other states as much. And so what you're seeing is all the historical discrimination, the historical hurt and pain, and people of color now getting to a point, hence having a black lieutenant governor, that we have a, we have mechanisms like Mass 365, other things that we can actually confront systems, and we have a voice that we never had before. So outside looking in, it looks kind of like things are going down, but it's not. It's actually we're confronting and changing, and this is what change looks like, right? This is the confrontation that looks like. So... Uh, at least that's my take. That's my take. Yeah. Are we are we agreeing? Are we agreeing? I'm like, I'm agreeing. Like, we don't we don't disagree that much. <laughs> yeah. No, we don't. No, we don't. We really don't. So, man, hey, thank you for everything that you're doing, man. I appreciate it. Uh, stay the course. Keep the faith. There's a lot of stuff going on for you, and uh, we just hope that you take care of yourself mentally, physically, spiritually, uh, because this is going to continue. My guess to be intense and ugly until actual elections, and so uh, stay the course, man. We'll see you next time. Thanks a lot, man. Always good to talk to you. You too. And we'll see you next time. Real Talk. Appreciate you. This is 365 Media.